everybody. We've talked about writing healthy relationships. Today, we're talking about toxic relationships. Cover your ears, butters. Stuff's about to get toxic. Now, a lot of people are confused about what makes a fictional relationship toxic. If the characters have a fight or a misunderstanding or one of them behaves poorly, suddenly they're toxic. That's just not the case. Everyone fights at some point. Everyone has misunderstandings. At the end of the day, we all fuck up sometimes. A toxic relationship is deeper than a few mistakes. It's a relationship in which one or more parties are experiencing regular mental, emotional, or physical harm. The people involved aren't able to communicate or relate to one another in a healthy way, so they're often in a state of conflict. Toxic relationships can be abusive, there can be gaslighting or manipulation, or it could simply be that they're shitty communicators and they aren't really good at respecting one another's boundaries. This type of dynamic is extremely common and it's perfectly valid to present it in your writing. In fact, I'd personally argue that it adds to the realism of your story to feature at least one toxic relationship. This topic was requested by one of my patrons over on Patreon, Gary. Gary wanted to know how to write a toxic relationship without making your readers hate the main character for being involved in it. So how exactly do you write a toxic relationship? I'm gonna give you 10 tips for doing just that. Let's dive in. Before we get started, I am currently hosting a fundraiser for the Breast Cancer Research Foundation, a nonprofit organization committed to ending breast cancer. For the entire month, you can donate to BCRF using the link below. Even if it's just a dollar, every little bit helps. For each fundraising benchmark we hit, a donor will receive a bookish gift as a thank you for their support, and we have 50 gifts up for grabs. Before we get to the current benchmark, how about a cancer factor? How can you reduce your risk of cancer? There are several lifestyle choices that are correlated with a reduced risk of cancer, and we're going to cover some of them now. First up is exercise. Even a small amount of exercise can potentially reduce your risk of cancer. 30 minutes of moderate exercise a day is a great goal to have. Additionally, studies have shown that exercising while undergoing treatment has been associated with higher survival rates of cancer, even for breast cancer. Diet also has correlations to cancer. High amounts of processed foods and red meats have been associated with gastrointestinal cancer, so if you can avoid these foods, that might be a good idea. Limiting alcohol consumption can lower your risk for certain cancers. Vaccinations are another option. HPV is the leading cause of cervical cancer, and it's also been associated with some head and neck cancers, so the HPV vaccine could potentially be helpful. Hepatitis vaccines can also potentially help reduce your risk of liver cancer. And lastly, attending screenings like a mammogram, a prostate exam, or regular pap smears can catch cancer early, which is correlated with a potentially increased survival rate. This is what your donation to BCRF is going toward. Again, they have been behind every single major breakthrough in breast cancer research, so you definitely want to donate today. This is our current benchmark, and these are the number of gifts in the pot so far. Some of the gifts up for grabs includes the work of one of my writerly friends, Caitlin Duncan. You could win some of her nonfiction books, including Take Back Your Book and The Successful Hybrid Author, or you could win her thriller, Her Buried Lives. Caitlin is extremely talented at what she does. You definitely want to check out these books. You can also receive How to Write a Successful Series by Helen Scheurer. This book is a game changer for any writer who's looking to release a series I personally learned a lot from it, and I'm sure you can too. Go pause this video, get to donating, and then come back to listen all about toxic relationships. Number one, toxic relationships aren't always romantic relationships. Pretty much any relationship between two or more people could be toxic. Familial relationships, friendships, business partnerships, the relationship between a teacher and a student. All that shit can get totally fucked up. I am sure you can think of some examples from your own life. For the sake of this video, I will mostly be referencing romantic relationships. However, most of the points I'm about to cover could be applied to pretty much any type of relationship. 
Number two, know your genre. Different types of toxic relationships fit into different types of genres. So it's a good idea to have an understanding of your genre and whether or not the relationship you plan to write works. If the main romantic relationship of your book is toxic, that probably wouldn't work for a romance or a rom-com because those books are designed to uplift. But if you're writing a drama, thriller, or tragedy, a main relationship that's toxic, even a romantic one, would fit seamlessly. Those genres are all about negative tension and suspense, and toxic relationships provide a whole lot of that. Another option is to write a love story. A love story follows the romantic relationship between two or more people, and it may or may not end happily. In fact, a lot of love stories are problematic and end in death. And of course, there's dark romance. And dark romance is a subgenre of the romance genre that follows dark relationships, which is basically a sexy term for toxic romantic relationships. Usually one or more character is abusive. It could be a bully romance, or it could be a kidnapper falling in love with their victim. When you label a book a dark romance, readers are aware that there's gonna be some questionable shit at play. Number three, subplots are a different story. All kinds of toxic relationships fit super well into subplots. In fact, subplots usually explore relationships of all kinds, so toxicity is fair game. Unless you have a very small cast, there's a good chance you are going to be exploring the relationships between different characters, and it's highly unlikely that all of those relationships are going to be functional and healthy. I personally really love writing toxic family relationships. In The Savior Sister, we explore a toxic relationship between Layla and her sister Kasima. I also think toxic or one-sided friendships are fun to explore because I think a lot of people can relate to them. And the best part about a toxic subplot is they can fit into pretty much any genre because everyone loves a little bit of juicy drama on the side. Number four, avoid romanticizing. Some writers are super against writing toxic relationships and while I understand their intention, I think it's a little misplaced. It's perfectly fine to write about toxic relationships because it's realistic. They happen in the real world all the time. I can't think of a single person I know who hasn't been in some kind of toxic relationship at some point. But there's a difference between writing a toxic relationship and romanticizing a toxic relationship. The latter is when you write a harmful relationship and present it as if it's a good thing. You're telling your readers this is what you should aspire toward in your own life, which can be really damaging especially if your audience is young. The key to not romanticizing is, first of all, making sure you're writing in the appropriate genre, as we've already covered, and second, showcasing the realistic effects of a toxic relationship. That means including elements like the disintegration of trust, growing resentment, insecurity, the development of unhealthy traits, and isolation. Every toxic relationship is different, so you need to make sure that the negative effects that occur are realistic to the character dynamic you've created. Number five, ask yourself, are we supposed to love the MC or hate them? If you're writing a romance or a heroic adventure, typically the reader is supposed to root for the MC. If that's the case, making their predominant relationship toxic may have the opposite effect. If they're the party causing the toxicity, readers are gonna think they're an asshole. But if they're the one on the receiving end, readers might hate them for tolerating all that bullshit. Even if that opinion isn't completely fair. However, plenty of books revolve around a villainous main character, like A Clockwork Orange, or you. In this case, toxic relationships, particularly if they're the offending party, can drive that point home. But I'd argue that it's become increasingly common for the main character to be somewhere in the gray area. Readers don't love or hate them, they just see them as a believably messed up member of society. This is another situation where toxic relationships, even as a focal point, could be very real. Realistic. Number six, characterization. So you've got a toxic character in your book. What makes them this way? There are a bazillion different reasons why a character could behave in a toxic manner, and there are a bazillion different reasons why another character might tolerate toxicity even though it's unhealthy for them. This is when a character profile is going to be a great asset. Dive into your character's backstory, their strengths and weaknesses, their hangups. What makes them the way they are today? Using my characters as an example, Layla is tolerating a toxic relationship 
relationship with her sister Kasima. Why? Layla's biological mother, as well as the woman who raised her, are both dead, and her father hates her. Her sisters are all she has, and she is clinging to them, even though she realizes that what she has with Kasima probably isn't good. Why is Kasima toxic? Well, this is a woman who was ripped away from her biological family as a toddler. That can create a lot of trauma and affect a child's emotional development. Now she's living with an adoptive sister who is revered and she is extremely envious. She resents this sister for having things that Cosimo will never have. Number seven, the slow build. If your story is following a relationship from the very beginning, keep in mind that it takes time for toxicity to blossom. Sure, there may be red flags, but that doesn't mean that the toxic person was a walking trash fire from the start. Something encouraged your character to begin this friendship or romance. And if you're writing full-blown abuse, there's typically a grooming period. This features lots of love bombing and affection in order to ingratiate the abuser to their future victim. Ultimately, toxicity usually doesn't happen overnight. There's a slow build to get to that point. And even when the toxic behavior ensues, you'll see moments of positivity where the toxic person is being sweet or kind to their partner or friend. Sometimes these positive moments occur right after toxic behavior in order to smooth things over. Other times they occur right before toxic behavior to give them wiggle room to be a massive bitch. Number eight, microaggressions. The little things matter and they can be very revealing. Microaggressions and passive aggression can be very beneficial in showcasing a toxic relationship. In fact, most of the toxic people I've met have put a lot of their toxic focus into the little things. This behavior is popular among toxic people because it's so small. Thus, if the victim complains about said microaggressions or passive aggression, it's really easy to paint the victim as being dramatic, that they're making a big deal out of nothing. It puts the aggressor in a place of feeling untouchable and makes gaslighting really easy. Yes, some readers won't pick up on microaggressions in fiction, but that's a them problem. The right people will absolutely notice these moments and appreciate that you included them. Number nine, research. Sometimes toxicity stems from shitty communication. Other times there's something more complex in the equation. Like we've already covered, sometimes toxic relationships are full on abuse. So you want to make sure you're portraying the situation in an accurate way that is not harmful to your audience. Additionally, sometimes issues such as mental illness can contribute to a toxic relationship. I've known people with borderline personality disorder, anxiety, or depression, and they realized that their mental illness was contributing to how they treat the people around them in a negative way. This is a tricky subject because you want to make sure you're presenting the mental illness accurately. Plus, you want to make sure that you're not implying that every person with this specific mental illness or every person with a mental illness in general is inherently toxic because that's just not true. This is where extensive research comes into play and I highly encourage you to hire a sensitivity reader. And number 10, play ping pong. People always ask why a person is willing to stay with someone who causes them so much suffering, but it's not that simple. Abusers often employ control tactics that prevent their partner from safely leaving. But even if the relationship isn't abusive, toxic relationships can still be hard to leave. There's a level of codependency involved. Toxic people tend to ping pong between the bad and the good. This confuses the victim and makes them unsure whether that person is all that bad. She's not a terrible person. Look at this wonderful gift she got me. He feels so bad about our fight last week. He's been showering me with affection ever since. Sure, they can be an asshole, but the sex is amazing. Showcasing this in your writing not only adds a level of believability, but it also explains to your reader why this person is staying in the situation, even though it's clearly sucking the life out of them. So that's all I got for you today. A huge thank you to Gary for requesting today's topic. If you'd like the chance to have a video dedicated to you, or if you want access to tons of other rewards, check me out on Patreon. I got it linked below. Don't forget to subscribe to my channel. I post new videos on Wednesdays, and if you want to be alerted as soon as I upload, ring that bell. Shut Up and Write the Book is available in ebook, paperback, audiobook, and hardback. So if you need a step-by-step -step guide to crafting your novel from plan to print, 
definitely check it out. It's linked below. If dark fantasy romance is more your vibe, check out The Savior's Champion and The Savior's Sister. They are available at all major retailers. They are award winners. You definitely want to check them out. They're linked below. And be sure to follow me on social media. I'm on Instagram, TikTok, Facebook, and BookBub. And of course, you can tweet me at Jenna Moresi. Bye! Hey there, this is Lisa Court leone narrator for Shut Up and Write the Book by Jenna Moresi. Be sure to subscribe to Jenna's channel and ring the bell. That way you're alerted as soon as she posts a new video. Trust me, you don't want to miss this stuff.